Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Allison Barlow, and I direct our Center for Indigenous Health here at the school with Dr. Walls and Dr. Warren. And uh, I'm just so grateful to start us off today with a land acknowledgement. And I want to really thank the Indigenous leadership and scholars um, connected to our center who created the statement for the university. So we humbly acknowledge that Johns Hopkins University is located on the traditional and contemporary homelands of Indigenous peoples. Our campus resides on the unceded lands of the Piscataway and Susquehannock tribes. We recognize the enduring presence of more than 7,000 indigenous peoples in Baltimore City, including Piscataway, Lumbee, and Eastern Band of Cherokee community members, among others. Together, we acknowledge the history of genocide and ongoing systemic inequities while respecting treaties made on this territory as a step towards reconciliation and strengthening relationships with indigenous peoples. We give thanks to the past, present, and future stewards of this land and respect all tribal nations' sovereignty and right to self-determination. We aim to hold ourselves and the university accountable to tribal nations' present and future well-being. Thank you so much. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Provost Jayawardana um, to start the program. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ray Jayawardana, and this is my uh, second week serving as the provost of uh, this great university. And I couldn't be more delighted to, to be here with you and to be part of the Johns Hopkins uh, community. And it is my great pleasure this afternoon to welcome all of you to the ninth annual President's Frontier Award Lecture. Um, thank you all for joining us for this, on this very special occasion. Today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Melissa Walls, uh, received the award back in February at a, at a surprise ceremony, as I understand it, um, that included university leaders as well as uh, many of her colleagues, uh, some of whom may be uh, in this room today. Uh, Dr. Walls is a co-director of the Center for Indigenous Health and a Bloomberg Associate Professor of American Health in the, in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Walls has dedicated her career to working with indigenous communities to promote health equity through culturally centered projects. Her studies, uh, particularly in behavioral and mental health, are recognized widely internationally uh, for their robust designs and community-based approaches. Her longest line of research, I was interested to read, titled uh, Healing Pathways, has been funded through seven uh, consecutive NIH R01 grants uh, and involves more than 700 individuals across three generations in eight communities. The, the longevity of uh, her studies really speaks to the, uh, her commitment and her uh, uh, incredible ability to build trust and engage authentically with these communities. Clearly, given the, uh, the great importance and the broad impact of her work, Dr. Walls is a a truly worthy recipient of the President's Frontier Award, which aims to recognize exceptional scholars on the cusp of transforming their fields. So congratulations, Melissa. Of course, Johns Hopkins is uh, fortunate to count many exceptional faculty in its ranks, so picking a single winner every year uh, for this award is a difficult task, which I'm, uh, which I'm sure our Vice Provost for Research, Denny Wirtz, will attest to. Um, and so I would, in that spirit, I would also like to recognize um, three other uh, terrific faculty members who are finalists for this award this year. Laura Ensign Hodges, Professor of Ophthalmology, uh, Shigeki Watanabe, Associate Professor of Cell Biology, and Nadia Zakamska, Professor of Physics and Astronomy. Um, I'm, I want to acknowledge the, the wonderful gifts of Lou Foster, who is the chair of the Board of Trustees of Johns Hopkins University, and alumnus David Smilo for the gifts that they have given and endowed uh, that have enabled us to honor faculty achievements through the President's Frontier Award. It's a, a terrific way to affirm our commitment to advancing knowledge and impact 
through frontline research, as Dr. Walls and the other finalists are, are, are very much in the thick of doing. So now, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Ellen McKenzie, Dean of the Bloomberg School of Public Health, to introduce tonight's speaker uh, more fully. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And um, let me um, welcome uh, Provost Jay, uh, Jay uh, see? Yep. <laughs> I practiced it too, right? <laughs> Jay Wadana um, as the, um, our new provost at the university. And we are just so delighted um, that he's here. And, um, and you, this is his first official event here at the School of Public Health. And I, I couldn't have been a, a better event for you to um, uh, uh, come and join us for. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and we're so delighted to have everybody here um, uh, in the room and also uh, folks who have joined us online. It's clearly a day for great celebration. Um, and uh, I am just thrilled to get together um, for this chance to learn firsthand from Dr. Walls. Um, as the provost mentioned, um, we first presented Melissa with this award back in February in a carefully, very carefully orchestrated surprise ceremony. Um, she thought she was walking into a meeting, a regular meeting, she was in town, um, and first she sees President Daniels, and then she sees a bunch of her colleagues that she hadn't seen for a while. And then she saw her beloved auntie from Minnesota. And she's like, oh. and I nudged um, President Daniels because Ron was just standing there so happy to see this um, wonderful. And I said, you've got to tell her what's going on. <laughs> and finally, um, he went up and told her what uh, the surprise was all about. Um, to say that uh, Melissa was surprised is totally an understatement. And I did pause for a moment to take her pulse and make sure she was still with us. Um, I, I want to apologize sort of um, for, the, <laughs> for that surprise. But those of you who have seen pictures um, of her accepting um, this award know how, how much it meant to her. And I mean, she was literally in tears. And it was just a, just a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Um, and um, but while you may be shocked by the award, um, your colleagues and I were not surprised at all that you receive this prestigious honor. Throughout her career in indigenous health, um, Melissa has conducted groundbreaking research, influenced policy, and helped to mentor and train the next generation of indigenous leaders. The work that she has done with the Obidre uh, people, the Center for Indigenous Health, and the school as a whole has been transformative. She represents the very best of public health. While we are delighted to have her in Baltimore today, actually, Melissa spends most of her time in Minnesota, where she is the founder and the leader of the center's Great Lakes Hub. Melissa herself is a member of the Kochijung, First Nation, and the Boys Fort Band of the Ojibwe. Raised, uh, based in her indigenous homeland, she is working not just for the indigenous communities there, but very much with them, always rooting her scholarship in community participation. Melissa's wide ranging work has shown the profound effects of colonization, racism, and discrimination on the health and welfare of indigenous communities. She has spent decades addressing these issues by fostering authentic community engagement. She relies on the voices, the insights, and the strengths of indigenous communities to guide her research and accelerate her, her goals in health equity. And as just one example, and the provost mentioned this, um, Melissa leads the Healing Pathways Project, a study that follows three generations of indigenous family members. It looks at both risk and protective factors for substance use and behavioral and mental health problems. The study is unprecedented in both scope and very much promise of the study, and it will help identify effective interventions that can address some of the most um, vexing public health uh, inequities in indigenous populations. This work has gained growing support uh, from the NIH, from the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, and from our, our own CYBAR, 
which is our school's initiative that brings together the basic and applied research to pursue bold solutions to big problems, and that's exactly what Melissa is all about. Now, beyond her research, Melissa has been instrumental in the growth and evolution of the center, including its new name and broad mission, broadened mission to work with communities not only in North America, but around the world. This is an exceptional time for Melissa, for the center, and for the school. We are truly on the cusp of incredible growth and change and impact. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, I had the great opportunity to travel to the homelands of the White Mountain Apache and Navajo tribes in Arizona with our school's health advisory board. And those of you who may not be familiar, our school's health advisory board every couple of years takes a public health and action trip. And this is an opportunity to take our public, our, um, uh, the members of our health advisory board to different places where we work and they learn firsthand about the work we do. And while we were there, we saw firsthand the work of the center and its indigenous partners, and it was a fantastic, just an incredible uh, week. Speaking for the group, I can tell you we will never forget the places we traveled to and the people we met. They gave us fresh perspectives and insight on everything from suicide prevention to water access to health education for young families and to life in general. We saw the power of indigenous knowledge systems and practices and were inspired to think about how they can influence our public health work more broadly. I know Melissa will help us continue to evolve in this direction. Her work, her knowledge, and her deep caring for her community have already made a profound impact on our school and our university, and that impact I know will continue to grow. The President's Frontier Award recognizes both past achievements, but very importantly, future potential. And Melissa's future is incredibly bright. She is poised and ready to help create a healthier, more equitable world, one where all indigenous peoples can thrive. Melissa, we are so very proud of all you have achieved and can't wait to hear from you today and, um, and hear about all the great things you will do uh, in the coming months, years, and decades. So Melissa, the floor is yours. Um, I'm not starting my timer, Denny, yet because I have to respond to the surprise of this award, which for those who haven't heard, I found out from that surprise that I don't like surprises, number one. And I also thought I had literally passed away because when I walked in the room, there was a photo of me looking off into the sunset like I was dead. And I just really thought I'm dead and this is my funeral and yet I'm a witness to it. So um, amazing. Um, it looks like we have the other finalists on the slide here, so I'll um, show those folks that were named earlier. Congrats. I don't know if in the room. And now I will really begin. Okay, so bonjour everybody. Um, I'm Eagle Clan. I am a Boys Fort and Kuchiching First Nation Ojibwe on my mom's side. And looking at this map, um, let's see if we got a little pointer here. Well, we don't. But if, on the upper quadrant here of the map, you can see Rainy Lake, some of you. That is the space where I was born. And at least six or seven generations of my Anishinaabe ancestors lived and played and um, created on these waterways, actually did their own forms of research and sustenance uh, activities. That waterway is now called Voyagers National Park. And when that park came into its existence in the 1970s, my family was no longer allowed to practice its cultural rounds in that space. And that's one of the historical traumas I'll talk about today. My dad's side of the family is a German-Swedish mix. There's a whole story to that related to the picture that you saw back, back here. This is me on a Swedish reality show, but that's not the point of this talk. <laughs> and so um, I uh, do share both sides of my ancestry because part of what I try to do in my personal and professional life is examine and, and really reflect on what it means to embody both the colonized and the colonizer and how that might create space for healing or moving forward in, in good ways. It may seem cliche to you, but 
I said this when the award was granted. It feels way too Melissa-centric. I'm very tired of hearing my own self talk. And I mean it when I say that some of the people pictured here, and there's more that I don't have photos of everybody, every day, day in and day out, are incredible partners and teachers and mentors and elders and students. And I learn from all of them. So miigwech to all of you, many of whom are in this room and online today. And you, Duluth team, I know a lot of you are watching. So hello over there. All right, so you know, not a lot of us learned about American Indian and Alaska Native contexts in grade school, even if you were going to grade school or high school in the United States. I know I certainly didn't. So I like to give this background briefly. Um, American Indian and Alaska Native people in the United States are a relatively small but growing and young population, as you can see here. The terms used to represent us are vast. I'm using American Indian and Alaska Native purposefully because of the third bullet point which has to do with us as a socio-political group. And Dr. Warren, who's here in the front row, talks a lot about the policy implications of our sovereign status as domestic dependent nations of the United States. That's a whole talk that we could go into another time. But coupled with that unique socio-political status related to the many treaties entered into between the United States government and the tribes is this ethnological state that we have, which is a racialized state, right? So um, American Indians and Alaska Natives in the United States have been racialized for the purpose of extinction. What I mean by that is when treaties were entered into, certain provisions, promises were made for the taking of land. Those promises might have been health care. They might have been other things. Um, and the federal government's policy was to slowly erode this socially constructed thing called blood quantum. How much Indian blood do you have in you? To the point that we would become extinct. And in Minnesota, our tribes have population estimations that demonstrate that if we don't deal with this fake blood quantum thing soon, we will be extinct. We will no longer be a people. And so that is very different than the racialization of, say, African Americans, where one drop makes you an African American so that I can exploit the African body for labor. Two very different ways of racializing major implications for both communities. Um, treaties remain the supreme law of the land in the United States. So indigeneity is a very special status and something that we have to pay more attention to. And I'll talk more about that today. Over the past couple of years, this bar chart has become infamous in public health. It demonstrates the reductions in um, life expectancy across here racialized groups in the United States. Part of this had to do with the pandemic it also has to do with so-called deaths of despair related to addiction and overdose, mental health crises. But the last bar is American Indian and Alaska Natives. And I often show this bar chart because it demonstrates the severeness of the inequities in our communities, just how massive this has become. And it is driven, of course, by inequities in chronic disease, inequities in exposure to stressors and social determinants. And all of that is linked to our history. Now, our history begins far before first contact with Europeans. That is a whole course or maybe degree that we could get into. But if I'm thinking about the social determinants related to colonization, each of the eras of federal Indian policy for what is now the United States has had one common goal. And that goal was to deal with what was called and is called the Indian problem, American Indian and Alaska Natives in this case. So whether it was through invasion, war, genocide, whether it was through removing our families, marching us to new areas that were literally foreign to us, the reservation period, whether it was through boarding schools and the taking of our children, or moving us in the 1950s and 60s, 60s to urban areas, which is why there's high concentrations of indigenous peoples in Minneapolis, Chicago, New York, LA, et cetera. All of these were meant to deal with the Indian problem. And they haven't worked because we're still here, right? So. Um, good for us, and we now feel that we're in a period of self-determination. I'll talk more about that as we go. But what our team, as um, was alluded to in the introductions, has really been trying to do is empirically document some of the ways that um, what we call historical trauma can impact indigenous health. And there are many pathways we can imagine. So what is historical trauma? In a nutshell, we're referring to the accumulation at the group level of traumas endured on purpose, with purposeful intent. So these are not acts of nature, acts of creator or God. These are the government deciding to do very horrific things upon a peoples, and that makes it historically traumatic. That's the term that we use. 
And we described several pathways that seem frankly common sense for how um, historical trauma can impact health. One is lived experience. Here's a photo of children in a residential school in Minnesota near the White Earth Reservation. These boarding schools have, they ran for over 100 years. They have parallels in residential schools in Canada. These are horrible, horrible experiences for our children. And it's not a shock that being forcibly removed from your family into a place where you don't speak the language, having your hair cut off of your head, having your wardrobe changed, being beaten, being, there are horrific things that happen to our relatives, our ancestors. Of course, of course that's going to have an impact on health. There should be no question. That also could be the catalyst for one generation rippling out to affect the next generation and the next. So my own great grandfather's experiences in the St. Margaret Residential School in the Kuchiching First Nation certainly affect my grandmother, my grandfather, that whole family, which in, fact, in turn affects my mother and has affected me. We know this to be true. Um, and then the third mechanism we can think about is, you know, this is structural racism, right? If, if we think about what that means, the policies enacted 100, 200, 300 years ago still affect us today. We can't ignore that. And um, his, historical trauma can act as a trigger in modern day context. So one of the measures that our team became, I guess, known for under the leadership of my um, advisor during graduate school, Les Whitbeck, is a historical loss measure. And this is really working with elders, hearing them say how frequently they were thinking about the loss of their language, the loss of their culture, the attacks on our communities, asking people in the Healing Pathways study that you heard about, how often do you think of those losses related to colonization? And what you can see on this slide is there's a lot of variability in how frequently people think about cultural loss, but more frequent thoughts are associated with poor health conditions, like depressed affect, like higher rates of substance use. This acts as a modern day stressor um, in the way that I conceptualize it related to historically traumatic events. How often do you think about not being able to rice on the lake that your family riced on for years? When I say rice, I mean gathering our traditional food, wild rice. That's a historical cultural loss. We've also demonstrated through Healing Pathways how stressors related to historical trauma can accumulate. So here we see the interaction of boarding schools, relocation programs, and more modern out-of-home placement through disparities in foster care um, representation. How that can act as a vulnerability factor for um, exposure to uh, feeling those cultural losses and dealing with microaggressions or discrimination and then how that in turn relates to our um, health, in this case, in internalizing symptoms for mental health. And last, we've shown, I'm just giving you a few examples here. This isn't the point of the whole presentation, but we've shown how that intergenerational transmission can work across three generations. So this simple path analysis showed uh, significant indirect effects from relocation experiences within a family across three generations of that family through maladaptive parenting behaviors, substance use problems, and depressive symptoms. So again, this is not to me like shocking, um, but it's something that the, the study has empirically documented and led us to this really conclusion that what we see at the group level in indigenous communities is a reflection of collective dis-ease that creates disease. And this is rooted in colonization. This forces us to frame our perspective in a way that is different than I was taught and different certainly than the way I was teaching medical students when I worked in a medical school, which is this is not about a personal pathology at all. This is about a normal group response to really crappy stress, like crappy is not the word for it, I'd like to cuss, but really bad situations. Any human group exposed to that much adversity should have it would be normal to respond with dis-ease, right? And um, this also is critical because as my colleague Katie Schultz led this article, we're in a, an era now where indigenous peoples are really advocating that an anti-racist approach to addressing indigenous health is inadequate. It's part of the story, but it's not the whole story. We also need to think about colonization and decolonization, and I'm going to dig into those very light topics for a bit, and then I promise I'll take us out at the end with some lightness, maybe. We'll see, I'll try to get us there. Speaking of boarding schools, um, I bring up this report often since May 22, 2022 when it was finally published. This is 
the federal Indian boarding school report. And here's my question. Why did it take until 2022 to be published in the United States of America? And most people still don't know that these boarding schools have existed. Most people don't know the story. If you haven't read the report, please, if that's the only thing you do after listening to me talk, please read it. Um, and it also fuels my bewilderment that we even have to invest all of these dollars in empirically documenting this inhumane process of historical trauma. However, the report in 2022 came out probably because of representation of indigenous peoples at the highest offices in the country. So when Deb Holland becomes Secretary of the Interior, we get this report. Some of you have heard me cite a report by Goodman in 2020. Um, this is very public health relevant. That tells us that um, as, er as recently as 2017, there were only two full professors who are indigenous in, in American Indian Alaska Native in accredited public health schools. Don Warren, now we can add three, at least there's one more. But Don, as far as we know, is the first tenured full professor at Hopkins who's indigenous, American Indian. That's shocking, right? These are shocking numbers. And so representation matters and is a huge issue for all of us in public health and in the academy. So let's go backwards. How did we get here? Does anyone know what university this is? Oxford, yes, Oxford University. Architecturally beautiful, of course, right? This kind of feels like Harry Potter, Halloween time. It looks like a place we might want to visit. You know, some of you probably know this, but I hadn't thought about it, that the walls around Oxford University are very purposeful and around many universities are very purposeful. They are built, this architecture is meaningful to signify who belongs and who doesn't belong. And those walls are built to literally keep knowledge in, a certain type of knowledge in, and to keep other perspectives out. And there's much written about this. I am not giving it enough credit, but you can dig this up in any sort of like Google search if you want to, to learn more about some of these origins. And this is critical because Oxford represents one of the early spaces and places for the birth of modern academia. So this is important for us to think about. What this means to me is that the very place academia, and this is a scathing critique of all of us, myself included, this academic space where it, it's supposed to be this knowledge creation, flourishing, beautiful place where we learn and grow is actually the home of epistemicide in a lot of ways, the killing of knowledge systems. And I'm not the only one saying this. Smarter people than me have talked about this at length. Um, but this quote from Hall in the second bullet really hits me, that the knowledge in academia represents such a small proportion of the global treasury of knowledge. Imagine how many knowledge systems across the globe have been discredited in favor of this Western canon of what science should be. And that seems simple and like, yeah, we all get that. But do we? I don't know. I don't think about it every day. And it's so deep when I really sit with it. Um, I think that uh, epistemicide plus colonization equals special attention to indigenous ways of knowing. Now this talk is supposed to be about the knowledges we privilege, and from here on out I'm gonna drill down a little bit in terms of indigeneity. So we had a land acknowledgement at the start of this. This is where land acknowledgements can become a seed for us, and actually Ellen and I were talking about this before we started, to ask questions like, who's, okay, whose lands are we sitting on? We heard about that. But are the Piscataway knowledge systems part of our daily discourse here, part of our classrooms, part of my research? They're not for me, maybe they are for others, but that is a disconnect, that is a problem if we want to really truly move towards decolonization, which I'll get to in a second. So, enter colonization, we have to talk about it. Um, there's a definition for you on the screen. I think most of us get generally what colonization refers to, but in the United States, we are dealing with a settler colonial society. What this means is the dispossession of indigenous peoples with a strong focus on land. So what settler colonists want most is the land. My colleague Joe Gahn at Harvard talks a lot about the fact that indigenous peoples in America should be by all rights the wealthiest landowners. I put it in air quotes because that's a different knowledge system for us, land ownership. Um, in this country, and in fact are totally the opposite of that. So um, land is critical. So you'll see movements towards land back. This is a big kind of hashtag that we see in indigenous circles. 
The other piece of this puzzle is that, as I said earlier, in North America and in the United States in particular, this colonization process came from Europe and is very Eurocentric. And what are Eurocentric values? We know them to be, at least in modern times, patriarchal, related to conquest, now to capitalism. The wealthy get wealthier. I mean, you know, all of these things that really are making us all sick. We all suffer because of this. This is not just indigenous people's suffering. And so um, the point here is that this Western scientific system that we all work within is not a non-biased thing. We tout objectivity, but that is a veil. Objectivity, um, I, you know, I don't believe that we can ever totally get there, but I think we assume we're there in modern academia, and in fact, we're working in a system that was built on regulations, political structures, power systems, and rules that were Eurocentric, often white male educated. So let's not pretend anymore. We're in a non-biased system. Okay, enter decolonization. Here we go, all these words I'm throwing at you. I know it's heavy stuff, but we'll get through. What is decolonization? Unfortunately, as indigenous scholar Eve Tuck feared, it is becoming a metaphor. It's sort of becoming like this word colonization or anti-racism, um, just a word we throw around without really knowing what it means. And I will not claim to know exactly how to deal with this. I know for sure there's no quick fix. On the screen, for those in the audience and those online, you can see some definitional pieces of this. But what I really think about, which is an equity-centered approach, is how do we undo the harms of colonization? Again, this is the question we can ask ourselves here at Hopkins. We can ask it in public health. We can ask it in academia. We can ask it in politics. We can ask it across the board. How are we undoing those harms? We shouldn't have to pretend that those harms are hidden. We have empirical data now, if you won't believe anything else, right? Um, so how do we undo it? That's a starting point for excitement for, I guess, the frontier, as you say, Ellen, um, for me, right? That's where I want to move forward. Or, and, I guess, we can move into this anti-colonial era. So Dr. Jill Fish is our colleague. She'll be on campus later this week, actually. Um, and many other indigenous scholars talk about moving into a research space where we understand that we probably aren't going to undo colonization. Like, I would literally have to split my body in half, I guess, and send part of me to Sweden and Germany and then keep, I don't know how that would work. And so that was kind of a joke, but <laughs> trying to lighten the mood here, people are looking at me like, whoa, she's going there. Um, <laughs> it's a joke, guys. Um, but how, but we, what we can do is name it. And we can do research that, as it says here, actively subverts the colonial gaze. What we mean by this is, Let's believe indigenous knowledge systems. And I'll give you a few examples to close us out of what those mean. That doesn't mean that we study indigenous knowledge systems to determine whether or not they're reasonable. That is not an anti-colonial era. It means we believe it. It also means that, as Kovach says, going forward means looking back. And for me, that means two different things. One, it can mean looking at the origins of the modern academy, which is a teeny tiny thing that I tried to do today when we looked at Oxford. And two, in indigenous communities, the way I hear this stated is going back to our original teachings, our original instructions, returning to cultural values, norms, and ways, and ways of knowing that are the ticket out of this mess for real. And I truly, truly believe that more and more as I grow older and as I talk to more elders. This is akin to me, this anti-colonial era, to a two-eyed scene approach that's touted in Canada. Um, this idea, it, it feels very practical to me. So I'm a trained quantitative researcher. I use models, as you saw, quantitative models to look at, to empirically investigate these questions. But my approach to it is very different than a typical research methodology. I'll talk about the approach in a, in a second, very briefly. Um, it also reminds me, I'm a sociologist by training, I don't know if you all knew that, but um, it reminds me of The Souls of Black Folk from W.E.B. Du Bois. He talked about life beyond the veil and this idea that African Americans lived behind a veil of discrimination and a veil of oppression and that behind that veil you can see both through the eye of the oppressed and the oppressors. That feels very similar to what I'm talking about with this anti-colonial um, focus on doing research and thinking about public health. Um, the tricky thing is 
This idea of legitimating indigenous ways of knowing gets co-opted. And so my colleague Victoria O'Keefe shares this lecture, or this slide in one of her lectures. This is a Smithsonian article. When it supports scientists' claims, they value what traditional knowledge from indigenous people has to offer, and if not, they dismiss it. So there's a good deal of evidence, and um, Dr. Warren talks about this frequently, that Western um, scientific methods discredit or actually just ignore that there's a great amount of indigenous knowledge on most topics, and they don't even care to look or ask. Rather, they say, look what I discovered, this thing. And so this is kind of the tension I have between this trying to fit into the anti-colonial practical era and then, oh, but please, please, I'm scared. Don't take it from us, right? I literally get scared. Um, there are a lot of areas where we could talk about where this gets really tricky. But guess what? There's hope. Um, I love this slide from the center of a lot of indigenous leaders. I have some of our students listed here too. I have had over the past couple of months some really, um, I don't know, flashbulb moments, memories with students and scholars in our center that remind me of some of the journey I've had through academia, which is at its worst, it forces us to question if we belong. It makes us forget who we are. Um, it makes us wonder if we're stupid. I've had these types of questions asked to me of some of our scholars. I mean, you can see it almost brings me to tears. And these leaders are fierce, but they are not made of steel. And there should be no question based on all I've said to this point, why they might feel othered, why they might feel they don't belong, why they might feel belittled. And um, I want us all to stop that. And I want you to start listening to us. And if you don't want to do it, then listen to the White House. Because the White House this year put out, um, put out some um, uh, federal policy to remind us to think about indigenous knowledge systems and federal decision making. The National Institute of Health has put out a guidance document specifically looking at American Indian and Alaska Native research. Um, this is commissioned by the NIH. And part of that report talks about orientation to research. So many of you have heard this acronym, community-based participatory research, CBPER. T stands for tribally-based participatory research. If we really do CBPR in an authentic, true way, where true empowerment is the goal, where digging deep into those power imbalances between the researched and the researchers, sharing resources in an equitable way, taking what might be considered a slow road and a relational versus transactional approach. If you really do all these things, and I am not saying that I do that all the time, let's be real, I am under the grind as well. I sit in front of my computer on Zoom most of the days, but I am constantly thinking about how can I center my own self, and there are things I do in a spiritual realm that nobody will ever know about related to this. There is work that I put in in my own time, so to speak, related to this. If we really did all of that, and you can see what some of our team does on the slide here, I am convinced of a lot of things. One is, I don't think we need IRBs. Isn't that controversial? But we would be acting in true, good relation with one another. And I see this happening where I sit on a tribal IRB. We are working on ensuring that researchers are in good relation to the community that they claim to want to serve. I really think so. Um, I also think that um, the way that research is done would be much more scientifically rigorous. We have a major issue in science with reproducibility and external validity. A lot of that would go to the wayside if we were really doing equity-focused CBPR, TBPR. I am convinced. And I am doing it half-assed, for real. I'm trying my best, but I'm only doing it half-assed, and I think I see that happening. And I see it happening with many, 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 I'm going backwards, of these amazing people as well. Okay, so having said that, I promised you I would lead us. Isn't that a fun picture, by the way? Look at all the colors. See, the colors take you to the bright. Okay, that's heavy. We need to smudge after this, but let's, let's just close out with the brilliance of some of these indigenous-focused projects. 
So the number one, what scientists would call hypothesis, that I hear from any Native community I've worked with, I say this all the time, is that our culture is medicine, our culture is treatment, our culture is well-being. And, you know, in the Western way, that is actually a testable question. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, whatever. With all of that aside, um, I really like to lift up Migas Gonzalez, who's one of our uh, scientists at the center. She has worked very closely with first language speakers to develop this Anishinaabe worldview model. Now, conceptual models are really important because they write down what we mean when I'm saying indigenous ways of knowing. They give you an actual roadmap for what the heck does she mean by that? It's, you know, Don, I've heard you say this too. It's not necessarily a mystical thing. It's actually quite practical. And you can see in this model, I'm just gonna look at the outer circles. First of all, there's a lot of circles. And I was speaking with Hariata, one of our, the students in our program this morning, about I wish it could spin. It's almost like a solar system or a cosmos that goes in all directions. And um, the levels of connectedness are so much more than just me with all of you in this room. There's energies that are other than human. There's spirits all around and there's connection to the environment that is more than just like the earth, like water, right? Like there's energy and spirit everywhere. And what's beautiful about her model is that it flies in the face of the scarcity tactics of let's say capitalism. There's no such thing as scarcity in an Anishinaabe worldview model. The creator gave us everything we need to be well on this planet if we are in good relation with all the spirits of this planet. And if we're not, we see what happens. There's waste. We take more than we need. We do harm to each other. That flies in the face of an Anishinaabe worldview. The other thing about this model is we can measure a lot of the things noted here. And so our team has worked on a variety of measures. I'm just listing them here, which in and of itself, by the way, trying to measure what is culture across any group is a massive endeavor. And I think indigenous scientists, not even thinking about our own team, are at the helm of what is important. So please pay attention to that science if you're doing anything around culture anywhere. So just as one quick example, um, our team in, in the Healing Pathways study um, asked participants a variety of indicators of sociocultural integration, kind of a, as an antidote to this perseverance on loneliness that um, we've been thinking about as a nation lately. By the way, the Surgeon General now wrote a book about social integration as opposed to his first loneliness book. But anyway, it's a lot more than just social integration, right? It's cultural identity. It's giving support. It's taking support. It's awareness of connectedness to all of the things in Migas' model. And people respond to these questions in different ways. This is a latent profile analysis of the way that responses are patterned within the Healing Pathway sample. We'll call them a low, medium, and high group of responses. Um, and it wouldn't surprise you probably, based on all that I'm saying, that people in the high integration group report the best physical, mental, and spiritual health across the board. So clearly these things matter. I'm actually gonna skip over this one. Um, and I am gonna end us on strengths-based research. So Victoria O'Keefe is here. This is a really cool study that she led. I also see in public health and in academia some pendulum swing to positivity uh, and I don't mean positivism, I mean um, like good stuff in life. And uh, I see it in like New York Times bestselling books. I see it in a book, the, Your Brain on Art, that was published by a Hopkins faculty member. It's really uplifting to me to see this. And indigenous communities have been demanding a narrative balance where we have strengths-based perspectives for decades. So please don't ignore us again. Please don't ignore all of the indigenous scientists. You can see that a strengths-based approach in, um, in, in this format is really based on indigenous ways of knowing and values. There's a lot to it related to decoloniality as well. So with that, and Denny, I'm gonna end with my slides that I always end on because everybody finds them compelling. So if you've seen them before, you'll still find them compelling probably because they are. <laughs> Who's ever heard of ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences? Have you heard of them? Some of you have, about half of the room. There's now lots of research to show us that things that happen to you as a child impact your life course into adulthood. So classic Kaiser Permanente study, more ACEs, more adverse childhood experiences impact your health into your adulthood years. Well, we also have been measuring now benevolent childhood experiences or positive childhood experiences. 
And what we find is that in Anishinaabe communities, which is the sample here, almost everybody is reporting almost all of the positive childhood experiences. We've never been talking about that. And in multivariate models, it's really the BCEs, the positive experiences, that are hanging in in predicting mental health, and ACEs get washed away. But again, everyone's talking about ACEs. What about the strengths? Um, and now we've moved into adapting those measures and expanding them to be culturally based, and I bet they'll have even stronger predictive validity. So I will close today with a quote from a masterpiece. A lot of us love Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass. Here she's talking about um, a dissertation defense, which we all probably remember or are getting ready for. She said, no matter how carefully you prepared, this was nearly a rite of passage for women scientists. The condescension, the verbal smackdown from academic authorities, especially if you had the audacity to ground your work and the observations of old women who had probably not finished high school and talked to plants to boot. And I love that because I think of my grandma, old woman who talks to plants and never finished high school. She's up in the upper right corner. And all of my ancestors and friends, and Brady, my son over there. So with that, I say Chimi Gwich, thank you to all of you um, for this awesome opportunity for us to invest in those women who talk to the plants. That's what I intend to do with these monies, Denny. So <laughs> um, and this is what we're gonna do. Uh, I learned so much. Uh, so we got some questions from the audience. Let's start with one and then I'll turn to this. Let's do it this way. I made that up on the spot. Um, but uh, you talked about a lot about cross-generational trauma yeah. being passed on from one generation to the next. But a question from the audience was, nevertheless, have you noticed anecdotally or empirically generational differences in how historic trauma is addressed by those in indigenous communities? Yes, we do observe generational differences in how trauma is, how historical trauma is felt and then how it's transmitted. And in addition, Allison, I think you've come up with this word like historical resilience. So the flip can also happen. So for, there's an example from Alaska Native communities where elder generations um, blamed colonization and the residential schools for their lack of ability to speak the language. But the kid, like the more current generation, blame themselves because they feel like they should be able to get it back. I might have that flips, but there are differences. And we just got Healing Pathways refunded. We're actually launching in a couple of weeks. So a lot of things happening where we are enrolling a third generation and we're asking across three generations what that experience looks like. Wow. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Don't be shy. I have another question. Okay. Uh, um, so, um, uh, well, a statement from, from Dave. You may know Dave. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you can't undo the harm, but you can change the system to promote uh, healing. Exactly. Yep. Um, with, By the way, on yeah. that note, I think I sort of alluded to this, but if we work in an anti-colonial way together, we all are going to heal. I really believe that. I believe that, and I've worked hard to try to figure that out from my dad's side. Um, I think that that is healing for all of us. So, so I had a question, and, and I think it's, it's, it's reflected in this, this question as well, which is, with over 500 tribes, what is the best way to both decolonize tribally while also collaboratively decolonizing broadly as indigenous peoples? Yeah, so this reminds me of questions about cultural specificity versus generalizability. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, it, um, it's something we grapple with all the time, and actually NIH asks about it frequently because we build one program for one tribe. Does that mean that we can just hand it over to the next tribe? And actually, um, Allison and I and a couple of our colleagues wrote an article about a wheel of specificity related to measurement yeah. where you can imagine gradations, depending on what the community's questions or concerns are of specificity or tailoring versus generalizable content or core ideas and measures, but it can also apply to public health programs and the center does scale up to other communities. Um, there are models of deep surface adaptation or general adaptation. So I don't have a one size fits all answer, but that is a question that I am surprised doesn't get asked to 
people working in white communities more often because those communities are massively diverse. Yeah. Like why why would it only be asked okay. to the tribes? Anyway. Makes, it makes sense. And you don't anticipate that even fundamentally that uh, diagram you showed would change fundamentally because the system knowledge you were talking about uh, would have large variations yeah, among those yeah, different food. tribes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't be shocked in that no, sense. No. Of, there's okay. probably some core constructs, right? That okay. are and there's talk about pan Indian, pan indigenous like things like about connection. Some of that is pretty basic and I think is probably deep down in there for all human cultures if we decolonize them. But um yeah, I wouldn't be surprised by some okay. culturally specific okay. bits. Mm -hmm. Okay, so If I ran what? If you could, oh, if you NIH. Could the question, if you could repeat the question so that makes sure. Okay, so Allison asked me if I ran NIH, which number one, please no, don't ever ask me to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> what would be the first thing that I would do to uh, promote anti-colonial? Yeah, um, I think it's a multi-pronged approach. So it would be a massive investment of NIH dollars. I don't know if I can't say this, but it would be a massive. <laughs> But it would be a reallocation of dollars into decolonization at multiple levels. Part of it, you guys, is our own individual journey. And we don't want to hear that because we're grinding all the time to get the work done. But it is an individual journey. So what are we each doing every single day to work on decolonizing this noggin? And then it's about um, cultural safety work. It's about training. It's about opening our eyes to new perspectives and ways of approaching the research. I would bring in some of the amazing international indigenous scholars who have indigenized methodologies in ways that I can't even begin to understand. Those are some things I would do if I ran the world. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. And also I don't want to, <laughs> for the record. Okay, I'm trying to think about how to ask this question. Um, but considering that colonialism has impacts worldwide and has mm -hmm. affected indigenous communities differently, as well as, um, you know, other countries that have had different ethnic groups, but were colonized for hundreds of years. And then, um, you know, the physical colonization was quote unquote removed. Um, considering that it has impacted groups all over the world and is still continuing to do that today. And thinking about how different groups have different urgencies of like, which thing they need to prioritize. So for some people, it might be coloniality. And for some people, it might be like physical occupation or colonization. Yep. How can we balance doing anti-colonial, -colo anti anti-racist work when it can look different in different countries? I think it's about approach. So when I bring up that CBPR, TBPR piece, you're right. When I uh, colonization ha takes many forms in a settler colonial society, it's about land and other as you're bringing up. But in a CBPR or TBPR approach that is authentic, that is not just me throwing around that acronym because it's cool and it's going to get me funded, but is authentic. I would be working with the community, and you may think, by the way, it's going to take a little longer on the front end, but the impact is so much more extreme and wonderful that it will actually, I think, slow. Um, speed up the timeline from what they call bench to bedside or you know science to translation. And so you would work in deep collaboration with that community to identify what are the pressing issues here. And I hear this from some of my um, colleagues and students who are working in global public health. That deep collaborative piece seems to be a missing component to a truly equity-centered approach to identify even ask the question, which part of the colonial project is impacting this community now and how do we work on that? I don't have the right. I don't have the answers to that. That's a very deep, um, thoughtful question. Yeah. Thank you. I also have a question. So, um, what you said about Matt being in IRB was—it <laughs> was terrifying. I wanted to ask a question about that. <laughs> That's okay, all. Okay. For the record, everyone, I didn't say we don't need IRBs. I said if all of these conditions were met. Okay. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oof. I know, I feel like I should ask you this like all <laughs> I think all of our scientists are, I mean, being at Hopkins traditionally means we're trying to 
better the world. You're trying to yeah. be better the community. Yet we still depend so heavily on things like IRB and um, we don't have a community focused approach yeah. all of the time. Um, what I, I would strongly recommend that we consider models from tribal IRBs. Because our mandate, while we have federal wide assurance numbers on the IRB I sit on, we have a very different review criteria. Like, what did you, who did you talk to in the community? How do you know the community won't be harmed? Who's given you permission to come here? It's a very relational approach. And actually, there, we've lost that relationality to IRB members who, honestly, that's a hard job. It is a hard job to sit on an IRB and you have to get through the things and everybody writes their application a little bit differently. But the relational aspect of that work also has been tainted. And now it becomes an adversary to us. Yeah. Let's, if we were really working in a relational way, that wouldn't be an issue. It would be all of us working together to do what's best for that community, including, I think I've said this to you before, Denny, I have yeah. examples of um, elders throwing consent forms in my face because it is appalling that I would ask them to sign their name swearing at me, I wouldn't give, I gave you my permission by showing up here. I'm not gonna sign this government looking form. And you know, I think our IRBs have evolved to understand that, but as scientists, sometimes we forget we have to explain that content, but also the application doesn't lend itself to me explaining that. So anyway, talk to tribal IRBs, move towards more decolonization and relationality in the process. And I mean, that's gonna be a long journey, but there's people working on that. So the, uh, an extra three straight with that conversation, remember, uh, about data ownership. Also, ownership, yeah. Can, what can is you, ownership? Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe say a word Yeah, about actually this? tomorrow the IRB has, a, no, it's Thursday at noon, there's a guest speaker who is, I would say, the leader in um, indigenizing data governance. And first of all, what does ownership even mean? That's That word comes mm -hmm. with a lot of loadedness. But we always say we're stewards of data. Um, Ownership belongs to the tribes, but you know, there's all these lawyers and people who get in the way. And actually I saw Kathy S just walked in. The NIH has done a huge overhaul on data sharing and access agreements with special considerations for tribal contexts that, you know, I actually think in an equity centered framework would apply to other communities, really, if we thought about truly being equitable. So she's in the colorful shirt. You can find her at the reception. <laughs> we need to talk. Should have her come and talk about that. Stephanie Carroll is the speaker on Thursday. Please, um, can you just, if you could use the mic, great. Thank you. Hello, Melissa, for Hello. your amazing words today. Um, you talk about relationality, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, we work in this institution where it can feel very siloed. We're, in a way, competing against each other. We're in a culture of busyness. Um, how do you have ideas about how to practice uh, relationality on like a everyday sort of smaller scale basis. Yeah, it's um, how do you get people who are really trying to earn their salary right through funding to just slow down and pay attention to each other? I'm not gonna. I'm in a privileged position. I just got this award. Like I've got this slush funds that I can say let's do some team building. But I think um, <laughs> I think that I see some of it popping up post COVID, post pandemic at the institutional levels, a reconnection, a reemergence. Um, but it's it's gonna take all of us, including leadership, myself included, as a co-director to, to make the space for that and to not act like it's something on the side because what else matters at the end? You know when people are dying, what do they say at the end of their life? It's the relationships that mattered, not how many grants we got. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> like Tenny. <laughs> I'm torn. Uh, I like. Uh, At least you're honest. Uh, Tell me. About I that. am so duly impressed by that lengthy list of awards you've been getting, and at the same time, yes, yeah. I'd like you to use I, this I, award to do something different, to to give yourself time yeah. to think something truly very important and very important that that rat race may not allow you to, to yeah. give yourself. So, I, you know, it's, 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 I think this award is the, your chance to, to, yeah. to do that just for a little while, you know, maybe not a month in Sweden, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> also capitalism, I mean, like that's, we all could probably agree there's some things that we need to think about there. Um, Time for the reception now. Let's thanks, oh, sorry, one more question, please, oh, okay. yes. 
Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, nice. Um, okay, so I think about um, lateral violence presently as a trickle down of cultural genocide. I didn't hear what the... Uh, lateral violence lateral happening, violence, happening yeah. now is a trickle down of cultural genocide. And I'm wondering in the research that you've done and the, um, you know, the positivity and things shared by folks in studies like, yeah. like this, for example, are you seeing like dialogue around yeah. lateral violence? And yes. if so, are you seeing solutions oriented from like younger generations of native folks? Yes. Yeah, so if, if you couldn't hear, Sarah's asking about um, lateral violence or lateral oppression, which can happen. You know, there's great philosophical writers who have talked about the wretched of the earth, right? Like this, as people become oppressed, they sometimes turn on each other. And that happens in all communities. And we do see that in our own communities. And actually, the model I skipped over, this concept of cultural efficacy, is our attempt to measure kind of the opposite of cultural policing. This idea that I feel safe to make mistakes when I, as I try to learn my language. I feel like I have role models, elders who will teach me and not judge me if I get it wrong. I feel like I'm not gonna be teased because my skin's a certain color, um, certain shade. We have that in many communities. So we actually measured it and we find that um, when we can promote loving, safe spaces for us to learn within our own communities, that amplifies the, prop, the protective effects of culture. And we do collect data on lateral violence, but we would never publish it. It's only for the communities that we are in service oh. to, because that's nobody else's business. Do you translate your work? Translate As into in, Ojibwe? Yes. Yeah, well, sometimes, so it depends. Um, most of our community participants in the Healing Pathways studies are not first language speakers, but the model that I showed you from Migas, all of the, oh gosh, there's a lot of slides here. I lost it, but. Um, yeah. yeah. All of the data for that was collected in the Ojibwe language and translated into English. Okay, mm -hmm. but the, kind of uh, circling in circle and go, going back and printing the results. No. Yeah, she does that. She does some of that. Okay. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I monopolized some of those questions. I apologize in advance. But uh, uh, let's thank Professor Walt for an amazing talk and uh, just you, you honor this university.